I'm Paul. I also uh, help organize London Gophers, so some of you may recognize me from there. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you today about code generation. In fact, writing less code, which is something hopefully we all want to do. So what are we going to do today? We're going to examine the principles of code generation, discover the main parts of a code generator, look at some popular code generators, see how code generation fits into our workflow, write a simple code generator, and as Michael kindly introduced, inspire everybody to join the Golang Tools community. So why are we doing this? Well, the idea is that adding, in my opinion, adding code generation to your tool set Effectively, what you can do when you're writing code is a really powerful tool because, as it says, as, a, as I'll go on to explain, it allows you to write less code and actually do things more reliably. So, what do we mean by code generation? Well, code generation is the process of generating code. There we go. <laughs> Simple as that. And code generators are the things that generate the code. Here endeth the lesson, so that we understand what code generation is here. So I'm going to come back to this flow diagram over the next couple of slides quite a bit, actually. We've got an input on the left and then an output on the right-hand side, and a code generator just sitting in the middle there. So what, what are code generators? Who are code generators? What are code generators? Well, has anybody written any Go code? Great. Everyone in here is a code generator of sorts. <laughs> And humans are very good code generators because we're very creative when it comes to solving and thinking about complex problems. But we're not very good at repetitive robotic tasks. In fact, I really hate repetitive robotic tasks, particularly when it comes to writing code. So that's why I'm a big fan of code generation. But we're lucky because computers are really good at repetitive robotic tasks. And that's where we can write programs that can also be code generators. Computers aren't at the moment, and let's not sort of dwell on this point too much, so good on the creative and problem-solving side of things. But as I said, this repetitive robotic part they are very good at. So let's take advantage of that. We can write programs for really complex things like Bitcoin, haha, and all of that type of thing. Let's write, write programs as well for simple things like generating code. Might not be quite as fun, but it's extremely good for your productivity. So what can be generated? Well, absolutely anything, if you think about it. We're talking about code generation today, but of course, programs can generate anything. Could be images, could be code, whatever you like. So we've talked about the outputs and the code generation themselves, but what about the inputs? Well, there can actually be zero inputs to a code generator, if you think about it. So has anybody here used Hugo? Yeah, plenty, a good, good number of people actually use Hugo. There's zero input, if you like, to a code generator that generates a template for you. You literally just run a program and it generates some code for you as a starting point. So that is, in effect, a code generator. Maybe you provide it some configuration. Maybe you provide it a command line flag. All of these things are different sorts of inputs to a code generator, and that's what we're looking at. So what are we going to focus on today? Well, today we're going to focus on Go-based code generation. That is, as you can see on the right-hand side, they're generating Go code using a code generator written in Go, using as our input Go source code. So this might seem a bit sort of counterintuitive, but well, it'll become clear as we go. So let's look at some examples of code generators that exist out there in the wild to make this a bit more concrete. So at the top there, you might be slightly surprised to see Go test is actually a code generator in itself. The input files to GoTest, the code generator, are the underscore test.go files that we all write and love. And the output is actually a main package that gets compiled and run for you by the GoTest command. You can see some other code generators there as well. If anybody's used gRPC, protocol buffers compiler is a very common one that you might have come across. We're going to focus on the last one today, which is Stringer. And we're going to use that as our motivating example to understand and think a bit more about why code generation is a good thing. So Stringer automates the creation of methods that satisfy the Stringer interface, as we see there. And it takes as its input, again, focusing on the input here, the name of a type t. And that's an integer type that has some constants defined of that type. And then it generates for us this string method, as we can see down at the bottom here. So why is this a particular problem? Why are we even talking about this? Well, let's take a look at, at, at this sort of motivating example a bit more. Here, we have a type pill. I'm, I'm no pharmacist here, neither am I advocating drug use, so let's, let's not dwell on this too much here. And this type pill, we've also defined some constants of that type as well, so a placebo, aspirin, ibuprofen, and paracetamol. And if you look, then we've just simple function, a main function at the bottom there, where we're getting, giving some advice to somebody on the fact that they should take two something per day. 
The slight problem, as you can see in this very toy example, is that we have the message that says you need to take two two per day. Well, clearly that's not very good. It's not particularly useful because we actually gave this constant a name as well, and yet it's been lost here. So this integer being output for us is not particularly useful, particularly when we went to the effort of giving it a sensible and useful exported name, in this case, in the code. So we can easily fix this, of course, because we use the percent %v verb there in the fump.printf. We can fix this by writing ourselves a string function by hand, a string method, excuse me, by hand. But this is clearly going to get very boring, and it's very error prone, and it easily gets out of date. As somebody, they've got to think about, oh, now I've also got to go and update the string method as well. So this is what I'm talking about, the repetitive robotic tasks. And this is just an example of that. And so this is where code generation comes in. And this is where Stringer, the code generator, comes in as well. Now, Stringer lives in the tools repository. Um, and it's uh, very simply installed. And as we can see here, when we actually come to run Stringer, there's a number of flags there that we can specify different parameters, i.e. inputs, to the tool itself. But all we're going to do here is provide the minus type flag here, which tells Stringer which type within our source code it should look at to code generate the string method for us here. So let's actually run the tool, as we have at the bottom there. Stringer minus type equals pill, and we're just running this from the command line for now. And let's take a look at the output. Now, the output here is significantly more involved than the code that we wrote by hand. But this is also kind of part of the, the beauty of code generation as well, is that the complexity of a number of nice features of this code here are totally hidden for you by the code generator. OK, so rather than having to write something like this by hand every single time, the code generator is hiding that complexity for you. So I'm not even going to go through all this code here, because that's not the point of this presentation. The point of this presentation is actually to advocate the use of code generators, because it allows you to do that right once and reuse many times of this generation of this sort of optimized code here. So the workflow, though, however, of running Stringer every single time, per package, et cetera. That's clearly also something we're likely to get wrong. We're going to forget to do it. It's easy and it's complex to run across many packages. We've got to write, run things in certain orders. Maybe we've got multiple code generators per package. Again, this also seems very error prone. So how can we do better? Well, this is where uh, one of the subcommands of the go command called, go ge go called generate comes in, excuse me. And that helps us to automate the process of running code generators. So instead of, as we saw, running it by hand, we're now just going to run go generate, and it's going to take care of running these code generators for us. So the, go the generate subcommand actually finds out what to do by sp um, special comments called directives in the code. And you can see one there. And so the beauty here, again, is that these directives to the generate command actually live alongside the code we're actually declaring things like the type pill in this situation. So instead of it being in some make file, which is very 90s, um, we're actually putting these comments into our code. And so alongside the type definition, we can have this go generate directive, which says, well, this is how we're going to do something with this type here. And it's very clear as well what code generator we're going to use. And then as you can see at the bottom, all we're going to do is run go generate. And we're going to give it a list of packages on which to run. And here we're just saying all the packages uh, in our module. Quick refresh on the Go tool, however. It's important to note that code generation is not part of the build process. Now, some people find this a bit contentious, but it's the only thing to remember now is that it's a step you must explicitly run before you do anything that is build-related, i.e. build, test, install, etc. So must run it explicitly before, but go generate encapsulates and wraps up the complexity of which tools, which code generators to run in which packages, for example. One slight snag, there is no dependency analysis. So if you have package A that imports package B, and both of those actually do code generation, go generate won't actually run those in the right order, i.e. B before A. But we'll come to that later on. So let's have a quick recap on where we are now. We understand what code generation is. That was fairly simple. That was on the first slide. So we've seen one example of where and why it's useful. And hopefully, everybody's somewhat motivated by that. I don't see you getting very excited about it. But at the same time, 
it is actually useful. We don't want to be writing all this stuff, robotic code repetitively by hand each time. So I think we can perhaps all somewhat subscribe to the, the thinking that actually code generation is a good thing. And we've also seen how Go Generate can help with the workflow side of things. Because again, we don't want to have to be remembering all the different flags, et cetera, that we pass to our code generators. So let's actually write our own simple code generator called Simple Stringer. We've been using Stringer as our motivating example. Let's carry on. So very simply, Simple Stringer is going to behave in exactly, it should behave and have outputs that behave in the same way as Stringer, i.e. it should generate for us a string method on a type. So we're just going to vary it slightly here. Instead of taking a flag, we're actually going to have an argument to Simple Stringer. Simple Stringer will then find all the constants that have that type uh, declared within our package, and then it's going to define the string method within that same package, exactly the same way that Stringer did. The actual code that's output is clearly not necessarily going to, it doesn't have to be identical to that of Stringer, and as we'll see, it won't. But it should behave in the same way, i.e., if we call the string method, it should behave as it did before. So what's simple Stringer not going to do? Well, this is a very simple example here, so it's not going to handle errors at all gracefully, slash at all. The code's probably not going to be very pretty. We're definitely not going to cover any edge cases here, so don't judge me on what the code you're about to see on the next few slides here. Michael gave a really good introduction here to effectively the layers of abstraction that we understand when we're looking at code. So everybody understands what a directory is, and within a directory we have files. And then, as we're all familiar as well, we can effectively consider a file to be a slice of bytes, for want of a better word. As the compiler then looks at our f the, the source files that we pass to it, it then moves up these layers of abstraction here, or creates these layers of abstraction for the jobs that the compiler does, our code generator is going to do much the same here. So we don't need to worry about the details of this here, is that all we know is, all, all I want to convey by the slide here is as we move up each layer here, we're learning more about the source code, i.e. the packages that have been provided to us. And that's exactly what our code generator is going to want to do as well. We're not just interested in the fact that file a.go exists. We're interested in the contents of the file. We're interested in not just the contents in terms of a slice of bytes. You can see we're sort of looking to get a higher level representation um, of a package. So part of that, as this slide here indicates, is the abstract syntax tree, which the Go AST package allows us to um, look at. And a good way of trying to understand what the abstract syntax tree is in terms of a representation of our code is using a tool like this, where we have got a visual representation of what the abstract syntax tree is because it's somewhat counterintuitive if you've not looked at an abstract syntax tree before. So if you haven't, I'd encourage people to just play around by using this tool here, write some code in the left-hand pane, and then the right-hand pane, you can actually see, ah, the abstract syntax tree represents this code in the following way here. As Michael also introduced, the layer above that is looking at types, and simple stringer will use both the syntax tree and types as part of generating the output. So let's just jump straight into the implementation here. I'm not going to do a live demo because that would go horribly wrong. <laughs> um, this is a let's think about it. It's a code generator. It's a program. Therefore, it's a func main. So let's just get very basic, define, declare our func main here. We need to take in an argument, which is going to be the type name. That's exactly what we do there. And we can declare a variable to actually gather the names of the constants of the type that has been passed in good start. So now, as I said, our, our, we're going to need to look at the structure of the code, and that's what I'm going to refer to as the abstract syntax tree, and also the types that we see within our code, i.e. the types of, of expressions within that code. This is the, code, the, the source, if you like, where we've declared our type pill. So this code here, I'm not going to go into the detail of it. I'm just sort of presenting these bits as blocks of the program for people to effectively refer to later on here. Here, we're actually loading that syntax and type information. And we're going to do that using Go Packages. As we see here, Go Packages is responsible for it. We've got these files on disk, and it's going to give us back this abstract syntax tree representation. It's also going to allow us to query types within that syntax tree as well. So that's all taken care of us on that, for us on that slide there. So now, the next bit is actually saying, well, we've been given this type name as an input to our code generator. We need to find that type. Where is that type declared? And for that, we actually use the type information. And here, we're just looking in the scope that is the package scope for the code that has been loaded here, the package where we're code generating. 
So that's nice and simple. We have that type in hand now. So now what we're trying to do is we're saying, fine, we've got this type. I now need to find all constants that are declared with this type. So if you think about how you would actually do that, while well, you think, well, so fine, the constants we're interested in are going to be those that are declarations at the top level of the file, and it should be some name, which has then got a type after it, and then some value to the right-hand side. And that's exactly what we then do by walking the structure, i.e. the abstract syntax tree, of all of the files in a package. So that's exactly what happens here. Again, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but I just described at a high level what we're doing. The syntax here is that the syntax of the package that we've loaded, we're then walking over each of the files, and then we're walking over each of the declarations, the top-level declarations within that file. As you can see, we're then only interested in the constant declarations, and within that, we're only interested in those contexts, excuse me, the constant declarations that are of the required type. Nice and simple. So I hope we've got these building blocks, and these slides will all be available at the end, that we're putting together now. So as you can see, we're then adding to that um, slice we declared at the beginning. We're gathering the names of the constants as we go here. And at the bottom, we're just sorting it for good measure so that we have um, effectively well-defined order on our output. So now, we've, we've effectively gathered the names of these constant types. Uh, gathered the names of the constants, excuse me. So now we actually need to generate the code itself. Now, lots of different ways of doing this, but one of my preferred ways is just simply to write a template and then execute the template. It's nice and simple, and you can pretty much see here how simple it is. We could have format.print lines that would just repeatedly print, print, print. But for me, it's always simpler to say, well, I can look at this holistically here in the template. It's very clear. If I generate the wrong thing, well, guess what? It's not going to compile. So I can easily go back in, fix the template, and just iterate on things that way. Here we've declared ourselves a template for the output. Super simple. This looks very like the handwritten version, if you remember, that we had before. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, this is using the text template package here. So that's a quick place to go and take a look if you're not familiar, familiar with the text, with, excuse me, with the template format. So now all we, we need to just gather a value that we're going to pass when we execute the template. We've done all the hard work here. The package name is given for us by Go Packages. The type name, well, that was provided for us as an argument. And we've gathered the constant names um, as we've been walking the syntax tree. So now all we're going to do is create an output file execute the template, and format the result. Formatting the result for good measure, because guess what? It's nice to look at. The, it should be possible to look at this generated code and for it not to be so jarring because it's poorly formatted, etc. So as you can see, we're running this through GoFormat at the end there. And the running of the template is just um, th there's nothing special that's going on in the slide at all here. One thing to note, though, is I've given the output file um, a special name, and that's to identify it clearly when I'm looking at a file within a directory as a generated file. Now, that's just a personal convention that I have gen underscore as the prefix to generated files. So that way, it's just clear to me when I'm listing a directory, for example, oh, there's a whole load of generated files in here. You will notice that I haven't added what is another convention in this package here, which is a comment at the top, which should say code generated by a simple stringer semicolon, do not edit. That's why, if you're looking at the file, you're also very clear that you shouldn't edit it. So that's one thing I should have done. So here we go. We just talked through this slide here, which is the effectively generating the output. Let's see it in action. Again, we're going to use go generate here as our means of running the code generator. So here is our code from essentially the problem statement all the way back at the beginning. All we've done here is add that directive, which is the go generate directive to call simple stringer. And here, as you can see, we're just passing in the string name of the type that we want to actually generate code generate a method for. That's it. That's all we've had to do in order to introduce code generation beyond actually writing the code generator in this case, of course. So let's see it in action. Clearly, we've got to run go generate first, because I said it's not part of the build process. Let's take a look at the output file that's been generated itself. Looks very similar to the hand-generated version that we had before. Good. OK, kind of looks good so far. And now let's run it. There we go. That needs a round of applause, folks. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to build some sort of drama to that point in the presentation there. Didn't work. 
Um, so simple, so where are we now? So we've introduced code generation, we've talked about that, and now we've actually written our, our very basic code generator ourselves. And hopefully this is a sort of a bit of an inspiration as to where in code you might also write code generators. Because as you've seen, that loading of syntax information and type information is really simple. Understanding how to use that, okay, that's a tiny bit, ma bit more involved, and we'll come to that later on. And there are just so many different creative ways in which you can integrate code generation into your workflow. You might look for type definitions, you might look for special comments, any number of things where you can look at either the structure of the code or the types in the code, that can be used as effectively, dare I say, an entry point for your code generator. So there's plenty of things that are wrong with this code here. It's not well tested. It is definitely not performant, which is where the output of Stringer itself is very much optimized. But it works. And that's a critical thing for code generation as well, is if it works, that's really all you care about, unless you then sort of run into issues where that generated code is sort of a bottleneck within benchmarks. So the focus is, if it's if, if syntactically correct, and it compiles, and it behaves as you need it to, you can give yourself a little pat on the back that actually it's a good start for your code generator. Lots of scope for improvement, but we'll leave it there for now. So as I talked about before, Go Generate itself has some problems in that if you have dependencies between packages and code generation or all of them, it's not necessar it, it won't necessarily do things in the right order. So that's what I mean by Go Generate itself doesn't have dependency analysis between packages. It just runs it for all the packages in some well-defined but not particularly useful order. It's slow in that it always reruns code generators as well. It has no concept of do I need to do anything here? And it's also somewhat hard to chain code generators together, where you have one code generator that generates some output that then serves as an input to another code generator. And sometimes that's useful. So this is where I, um, this is the motivating reason behind writing a tool called Go Generate. The Go tool, as everybody uses it today, is incredibly efficient when it comes to doing build tasks because of something called a build artifact cache. That means that when you come to run something like go install, it doesn't rebuild everything from scratch because it realizes I've got nothing to do here. So that kind of feature sounds like something we also want for code generation. And that's where go generate the tool, subtle difference, no space, comes in. It also is aware of effectively the inputs to a code generator and then doesn't rerun the code generator if it notices those inputs haven't changed in some way. And so it also, therefore, keeps track of the outputs that are generated, and that's why it's called an artifact cache. It's a wrapper around GoGenerate that's aware of these changes in inputs, or lack of changes, therefore. It's also aware of the import dependencies, so runs code generators in imported packages first, and sort of walks the reverse dependency graph as it goes. The readme actually gives plenty more details about how GoGenerate works. I'd say it's in a sort of beta stage. Uh, so please um, report any bugs that you see. So why is it actually useful? Let's just take a look here. We're running go generate as a, um, as a command here instead of go space generate. And we're running it in a special trace mode to see what it's actually doing. And the, t uh, the comment there, the, the timing there is how long this command actually took. So 4.1 seconds. Now you might think, OK, 4.1 seconds. I've introduced artificial delays within this process here. 4.1 seconds for code generation, is that good, bad? Well, it's quite annoying if you're actually doing a make some changes, rerun code generation workflow, or just iterating in that workflow, particularly if the inputs to the code generator, excuse me, haven't changed. So this is when you run go generate for the first time, but this is where, much like the go tool, the artifact cache comes in. So when you run it the second time, it's significantly faster because it says, well, in this particular case, there's absolutely no change to the input, so I'm not going to rerun the code generator at all. So if you have hundreds of code generation steps in your, in your code base, which is conceivable, you clearly don't want to be looking at the abstract syntax tree, looking at the types for every single code generator within every single package every single time you run it. So this is where the artifact cache comes into its own here. Please give it a try if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, please report any bugs. So where, is, where, where next for GoGenerate? Michael, again, gave a really good introduction about the Go Analysis framework before and how the Go Analysis framework, with its suggested fixes to users, will ultimately want to be included in GoPlease, which is the language server which will be integrated with all editors. 
That's exactly where cogeneration should, in my opinion, also end up, is that it should be nice and possible to also have suggested fixes, but also cogeneration that you can initiate and easily trigger from within your editor. So there's one huge performance gain as well, is that if, like the analysis checkers, these things get compiled into Go Please, they will be much faster again than running even Go Generate, the special wrapper around Go Generate. So that's it as far as code generation is concerned. Just to briefly mention the Golang Tools community as well, because everything that Michael talked about and everything that I talked about effectively falls under this banner of tools in Go. Golang Tools is a community, a small little sub-community, if I say, of people who are interested in writing tools and understanding tools, learning about tools, benefiting from tools. And in tool, by tools, we mean things like code generation, writing analysis frameworks, your editor plugin. It sort of all falls under that very general header there. We have a call about once a month, and it's for anyone who's interested in it or think they might be interested in, in this uh, space. So please, I've got links from the slides here. See the wiki for more information. So quick recap, because I think I'm well ahead of time here, and we can do questions afterwards. We've examined the principles of code generation. We understand what it is. We understand how a code generator is structured. We looked at some popular code generators. We've written a simple code generator. That can use as a template for people writing their own code generators in here. We've seen how it fits into developer workflow, because that's a bit of a missing step at the moment. People aren't necessarily so clear how code generation can or should fit into their workflow. We thought, we've also seen as well how it will fit into people's workflow if and when code generation gets integrated with Go, please. And hopefully, we've also inspired everybody to join the Golang Tools community as well. So a few links here. But other than that, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the organizers. Again, please make sure that you find an organizer and say thank you for running GopherCon. They get, they get all the, dare I say, the negative feedback if there is any. And I don't think there is so much this year. But do make sure that you thank the organizers as well for an amazing GopherCon UK. And I think we prob I don't know whether we have time for questions, but thank you. We have, we have four minutes, so I will just take one or two questions, and I'll shout them out. Johan? No, go for it. I'll repeat it out. Uh, what the devil does that part in the uh, string regenerator stuff with the function? You go to the stringer uh, generator code. Yeah. Some array stuff. Ah. May I refer you to Roger? So Johan's question was, in this string are actually generated output, there's some funky stuff going on here that optimizes things in certain ways, optimizes for compiled output, but also errors that you see at compile time as well. Roger Pepe, standing over there, will be able to answer the question for you. Yeah? You were talking about dependencies. Yes. Yeah, so the question was about dependencies, and I made the point here that Go Generate itself as a tool for running your code generators has problems because it's not dependency aware. So let's talk about the two parts. There's effectively the input that is your source code to the code generator. That has dependencies because of things like import statements. Yep. So you, you're, you're code generating within package A that imports package B. You probably want to run your code generation in package B first and then run your code generation within package A. So that's, Go Generate is not aware of that. And so we'll actually, in that situation, run package A first, then package B, which is not very helpful. Go Generate, my tool says, ooh, I spot there's a dependency here. Let me ensure that I run code generation in package B first, and then package A. The second part of your question was, what if your code generator adds dependencies itself? Go Generate is also, the, the Go tool itself, is not aware of those either, but Go Generate, my tool, is. So if it adds further dependencies, it, goes, it says, oh, hang on, I've added a dependency here, and I've not yet run code generation in that new dependency, and jumps over there. And so it, that graph, the import dependency graph, is also dynamic, as you pointed out, within code generation. And code generator, the, the workflow needs to be aware of that. And that's where sort of my version of Go Generate is aware of it. Does that help? Yes. OK. One more question, then it's lunchtime. I'm keeping you from lunch. Go for it. Uh, your layers slide added yep. an XSA uh, package 
Yep. Um, I'm not using it in this example here. I'm just showing here the different layers of abstraction that exist. Your code generator could use, um, it could utilize SSA if it needed to slash wanted to for its output. It's entirely up to you. You don't need to use any of these layers here. As I said, something like Hugo has zero input. It is just a template generator uh, in, 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 when you're sort of creating a new project. So if you don't need any inputs, don't use any. You don't need to load any code, et cetera. So it, it, it's, it just depends what you're trying to do with your code generator. <laughs>